B.W. Williams, also known as Diamond Dave, the founder of the highest paid part time job on the Word Options training course. What we want to really quickly ask you to do is if you like the content here, give us a like, a share, let somebody know about it. Uh, what we're trying to do and what we really want to do here is help you make money in the market. Uh, this is not like a CEO promotion or a company promotion channel. Uh, we're, we're really here to make money and we desire other people that want to make money. And uh, that's kind of why we're here and what we're trying to do. And so what we're going to talk about is this particular Fubo TV incorporated a Fubo play and kind of give you an understanding of how we actually broke this play down. And so you can kind of try to apply this to some of your trading. And maybe there's something in, in my particular process or the way I which I analyze things that you can maybe add into your trading and it can put you in a position to be a little bit more successful and you can just continue to get better and better over time. And what I want to kind of show you is my analysis of things and how that may be different than the mainstream and what they see. Um, what we're looking at is Fubo TV, right? And so Fubo TV, uh, to give you a really brief uh, analysis of it, it's supposed to be like a competitor to Netflix or maybe even Roku. OK, so they're a streaming service. Uh, they're what I call like an upstart company where um, they may have been around a good amount of time, but they really haven't gotten a lot of attention. If you look at their chart, they traded very flat for a long period of time and then they started to build up. Uh, so they're not really a strong competitor in this space, but a lot of people believe that maybe eventually they will be able to be a considerable competitor uh, in the streaming space. Now, when we understand something about markets, there's normally going to be one to two market leaders. Everybody else is going to have an inferior position. And so therefore, you got to kind of determine if you really believe that Fubo can take on a Roku or take on a Netflix. You know, do you really believe that about them? However, what we're going to do is kind of talk about why I felt like this would be a good candidate for a put option uh, based on, you know, what I knew was going on in the company fundamentally, some of its fundamental data. And then also the fact that I believe that it was going into IPO lockout and some of the, um, I would say, controversy around that. So really quickly, we're just going to look at the option play. So it was a, a $30 put that expired on April 9th. So the put was bought on March 23rd, which gave me a good amount of expiration because I believe that there was going to be a binary event that was going to take place between 23rd and the 9th. Uh, that was going to really start to bring the price down. However, when I started looking at the chart on the 23rd, I saw that it was already falling a lot. So I said, let me go ahead and get in now as opposed to waiting closer to when I think this binary event is going to take place because the way it was selling off, I said, it's going to, you know, kind of probably flatten out and start plateauing before we ever get to the binary event. And that's kind of where we're at right now. So on March 23rd, I bought two contracts uh, for a, a strike price of $30 to expire on April 9th. Then I exited those particular plays on March 29th uh, for a 230% return on interest or return on income however you want to call it right so that the return was 230 percent positive based on what i paid for the particular contracts okay so what we talked about before is that what you always want to do is master percentages first then worry about position size okay so master the percentage return first get your percentage returns down and then start worrying about position size because 230 percent roi is 230 percent roi so if you take ten thousand dollars right and you turn back 233%, it's the same thing as if you take $1,000. It's a still a 233% return that's going to be positive based on what you put into the play. So we want to really encourage you to worry about mastering your percentages and being able to exit in and out as opposed to worrying about the, uh, the size of the play, right? Get your percentages down and then start increasing your position sizes. And then that's how you're going to get to the incomes. Now, if you look at this particular play, we take the 1800, we subtract the 551, we're close to the $2,000 of profit. And so what I want you to understand is that I was trying to express to people earlier is that it's not really that difficult to get to 2K profit in the market. Um, if you just really understand how to play it and you kind of understand what's going on in the market, it's really not that difficult. And, you know. I want you to get to the 2K because I want you to realize the possibility of the market and you can start building up. You know, I know people that are doing ridiculous numbers as options traders. A lot of them are very, very low key. And it's really not that difficult. Once you start to understand what's going on in the market, then you understand percentages and then you start to understand uh, position size. Um, because I'm into, I do a lot of puts and I'm very good at doing put contracts. One of the things that is helping me is that there's a lot of volatility in the market and 
um, for some reason, we're, we're coming out of we're probably coming out of a season of a lot of downward pressure on a lot of what we call tech stocks. OK, so I'm able to take advantage of a lot of that combined with the fact that there's binary events going on in the market. There's already a lot of downward pressure. So what we saw last Friday was that this company really started to sell off. And then Monday again, it started to sell off. And that's when I exited. So I was able to take advantage of a lot of the downward pressure in the overall market that really helped this put out. OK, so you got to understand that you can be benefiting in the market on your on your single micro play. What's going on in the market can also benefit you. It also can hurt you. And you got to understand how to manage your trade based on what is also going on in the larger market, in the larger context of the market, as opposed to just the individual company that you're in. Now, let's look at this company a little bit. So what I want to show you first is the chart. So let's go ahead and get into the chart. And what I want to show you is that if you look at the one year, OK, of this particular company, we're looking at the one year. What we're seeing is that it hit this peak. So. First, let's look at the trading history. It's pretty much flat. So they IPO really, really flat trading history. And then it started to move up. OK, so what we're looking at is the company hit a peak of around sixty two dollars and it sold off really, really heavily. I mean, it sold off really hard off that sixty two dollars. OK, so every day it kept selling. Hit a high of sixty two, kept selling, then consolidate a little bit. Right sold off a little bit more and it walked its way back up to around the $50 mark and then has been selling off really hard ever since then. Now what you're seeing here is a support was around this $27, $28 mark. So once it got under that support, right, we kind of knew that it was in a bad situation. So I bought this contract on the 23rd and was seeing at the 23rd, which is 323, it opened at 3140 and closed at 30. The next day it was even lower than that. So it's 23rd. So when I bought the contract, which was I want to say 323, we were getting really close to that support. And so that's when I decided to go ahead and get in because I realized that if we get under that support and it starts to really, really fall, what's going to happen is the market makers are going to ramp up the volatility forecast because they see it falling underneath the support. It's almost going into a free fall pattern similar to here right and then it's going to cost me a lot to get in the door on top of with a lot of the volatility in the markets if the vix is really really spiked up it can really start to impact the um, price points on puts because there's going to be a lot of uncertainty and fear in the market and then i'm going to, have to pay a lot higher to get into the door so i decided to get in at that particular point so let's zoom in a little bit more on that so 323 it opened at 31 it closed at 30 that's when i entered Right. And then we saw it just kept selling off. We did have a green day on the 25th. Right. But then that was surrounded by two more red days. And that's kind of what you're seeing with this. You know, it, you'll get multiple red days, get a green day, some more red days, one green day. And you just get a, so a few green days mixed in with red days. But what is it really doing? It's just continuing to fall. Even here, when it's when you get this gap up, it closed red and then it fell really hard right back down. OK, now it did a lock up in which it released a lot more shares into the market in December. I had information that it was going to do that also on the 6th. And so what I was initially going to do was hold this play until the 6th, right? But because the returns were so good on the play already, I decided to get out. It doesn't make any sense to try to hold this play until next week and trying to get another 15 to 20% out of the play because what I think it may do here is trade horizontal for a little bit and then start its next leg down, Okay. So the, the support after that 28 support is around here in the 14s and the 15s. And so I think that's where it's headed. But like I said before, is that the return was so great, it didn't make sense for me to sit in the play anymore and risk it turning in the other direction. Even though today is going to probably be a green day, it may be a green day surrounded by some more red days. Now, here's some of the statistics that kind of outside of the chart lets you know that you're not dealing with a really, really strong company, right? So profit margin is negative almost 300%. Operating margin is negative by 100%. Uh, return on assets is negative by 23%. Return on equity is negative by 141%. Okay. Gross profits negative by 16 million. Right. EBITDA negative by 200 million. They do have a little bit of cash in the company. Got $134 million, but they total that it's 33 million. Operating cash flow is negative $149 million. Now, this is not a really well-managed company. Can they become well-managed later on? Yes, but currently right now, they're really not a well-managed company. Um, and I don't know because I don't listen to their earnings calls, 
why so much money is leaving this particular company and why they're not driving a certain amount of revenue, uh, why their margins are so bad, their margins are terrible. I really don't know. However, this is not a really well managed company, even though it's a quote unquote a tech play. So you got to understand is that every tech play doesn't mean that it deserves your investment. And so many people get into plays like this. Why? Because they're seen as inexpensive. Right. So a lot of people get seduced into these type of plays because they're seeing well, I can get in for twenty five, thirty dollars. The question is, if you don't know when you're going to get out. Right. And you saw a lot of massive selling that to 60. You can get trapped in this play. And just because other big firms are in this play, big firms are in everything. Goldman and JP Morgan, they're in everything. People talk about ARC. Big firms, a lot of big firms, they're so diversified. They're in every sector because they're they're hoping that those sectors take off and run. And then, you know, it makes their overall portfolio look good. So big firms are in a lot of stuff and they also trade in and out of a lot of things. So just because a big firm may have been in this play, it doesn't mean that you need to be in it. It means that they're in it and their their portfolio uh, objectives may be totally different than yours. Now, another thing we want to look at, and this kind of gives you some indications that we look at the float. We got 126 million. I'm showing on Yahoo that we got institutional holdings of around 7%. Uh, and then we see that the float is around, um, I'm sorry, short percentage of the float is around 20%. Okay, any any short percentage, to, in my personal opinion, over 10% means that's a big short percentage, right? So if 10% if of the float is being shorted, that's a big amount of a lot of bearish sentiment on that particular company. So they're around 20% which means that there's a lot of bearish sentiment in this company. Now, what I want you to really understand is that I have 7% owned by institutions. However, when I go to NASDAQ, it's telling me that institutional ownership is 40%. Uh, either way, none of those is really a, a large amount of conviction from institutions. Uh, if you look at some other companies, you can see 60, 70, sometimes 80% institutional ownership. One of the reasons why this company can struggle, right, as it goes down is because it doesn't have a large amount of institutional ownership. And what I want you to understand, especially when you have institutional ownership, that's really, really diverse. And they may each own like maybe, you know, a few two one one million shares, two million shares. And it's very, very diversified is you don't get what you call a price floor. Now, what do I mean by a price floor? A price floor is that there's a particular price point where an institution to say, you know what, we're going to set conditions electronically to where as shares get freed up and they hit this particular price, we will just automatically buy them up. Why? Because we have so much conviction in this company. So if you look at something like Te not Tesla, if you look at something like Uber or maybe Lyft, they have a large amount of institutional ownership and support. So what you get is really, really solid price floors. So as Uber starts to hit a certain price, it automatically gets bought up. So it may not go up, but it'll probably maybe even consolidate for a little bit um, to keep it from just totally bottoming out. When you look at a company like this, you know, it, it fell off and it didn't get brought back up until it hit twenty four dollars. OK, so I want you to look at the chart. It sold off here and it, it didn't get bought up again until it hit twenty four dollars. And that's when buyers came back in. Right. And then buyers came back in. They sold off a little bit at thirty five. They pushed it back up to around fifty dollars. And then they sold it back off again. And so now it's lower than the price in which they got bought back up again. It got bought back up again around $24, $25. It's now lower than that particular price. So what we see with a lot of retail, and this is something that a lot of retail people don't understand, is that retail can't organize price support. I saw this with the Kodak play. Okay, so retail doesn't know how to organize their capital when they don't have enough capital but then they don't know how to organize their capital to where if i'm in a particular company and it gets under a certain price then what we do is we just buy everything at that price and so when we understand that a company doesn't have a lot of institutional support uh, if you can get a particular um platform that you have confidence in their institutional support percentage or the institutional support number and you have confidence in that number you can kind of determine whether or not you think if this company gets attacked it has people that are willing to buy up those shares at that particular price point. And if it if it doesn't have that, well, then it's going to always be subject to short attacks. It's going to always be subject to uh, getting sold off really, really rapidly from people just taking profit and getting out because it doesn't have institutional support to essentially create a platform or to create a floor for that particular company to bounce off of and to create a new support. So what we're seeing here is that the support was around the mid 20s. It bounced back up. 
And then now you're not seeing a really strong support now. Right. Because many of these buyers may have sold off here and got out. Right. And so now what we're saying is that this is beneath the last support. We're seeing a support around 15. So when I'm looking at companies like this, I'm, I'm bringing in a lot of different data points to kind of try to understand what do I think is happening. You know, first, what did the IPO at? Right. Where did it IPO at? Because based on where it IPO at or based on where the original investors got in at, where do I think they're going to start trying to take profit? So if I'm looking for an IPO lockup play, my question is, well, where did the majority of people that are in this particular company, where did they come in at? Because that can make be an incentive for them to get out. How long do they operate before they IPO? Because that can also be another incentive for them to get out. Like Palantir, the guy said that the reason why we went public is for everybody that's been with our company over a decade, they can get out via the public markets, right? So they, they're IPOing or they're doing a direct listing essentially was an exit play for them. They want to get their people that took less money and salary to be in that particular company. They want to finally give them an opportunity to start making some real money via the public markets. So understanding the narrative behind the company and then also understanding that, well, do they have institutional support? When is their lockup date? How are they trading before the lockup date? If a company a lot of times is already sliding down before they go into their lockup date, it's, it's very likely they're going to keep sliding down. Why? Because people are already getting out. It's not a guarantee, but it's also very likely. Right. So you got to understand is that is there a lot of selling pressure? What is going on in the macro economy as they approach this particular binary event that we're calling a lock update? So these are the things that I look at. Now, I want you to understand something. We talked about percentage size and, and uh, contract. We talk about percentage size and then contract size. I could have made a 233 percent return on any amount of capital that I put in, right? And so what I really want you to understand the power of the markets. This play, I had a lot of conviction on it. I understood what was going on from a macro standpoint in the overall economy. We're in an era of a, a, a lot of volatility uh, because the market historically is kind of bearish this time of the year. We're probably going into a bull season starting early April. So with a lot of things going on with the treasury yield, things of that nature, there's a lot of bearish activity and a lot of the weaker tickers that may have been strong in, in mid to late 2020. A lot of the weaker tickers and a lot of them are tech plays or EV plays slash tech plays. A lot of these weaker tickers are just going to get taken out because they really weren't really strong companies to start. They got a lot of good PR. They got a lot of good attention. And like I said, is that because of their pricing, a lot of people think this is a good place to come in at. Because if you're trying to buy Tesla, you got to put up five, six hundred dollars with this company. You only got to put up twenty, twenty five dollars, maybe 60, even though it's sold off from 60. Therefore, it's a lot more attractive to a lot of people, but it's easy to scare retail out of a play. It's easy. You just got to slam it real hard on the first first five minutes of the day. And most retailer run out and go do something else or slam it real hard late in the day. And most retailer a, a, a get out or. You just do what we call this probably was here was they just did a stop hunting where they sell it off. And when they find your stops, it triggers your stops and then you sell out because you already have your stop condition set. So the hedge funds and the market makers know how to stop hunt using algorithms and they can just keep selling it off. And if you have conditional stops set in your account, it'll just sell your particular shares. Right. And then you got to try to figure out, do you want to reenter at a higher amount or are you just totally out of the plate? So because retail is really not equipped to really deal with certain type of trading scenarios, they're definitely not equipped to deal with predatory trading scenarios. It's kind of easy to watch them get forced out of plays. And then as they observe retail getting forced out, more and more would just voluntarily sell because they want to get out of the scenario. So then the question is, as a trader, how do you take advantage of those situations to put yourself in a position to make money for yourself and your group? And so that's what I can teach you how to do. But you just have to be willing to learn. You got to be willing to read. You got to be willing to take some time to study and kind of understand what's going on in the market. And you got to take the responsibility on yourself of being a savvy trader as opposed to somebody just just following the crowd. OK, this was not a ticker that a lot of people even know about. Um, let me see how much it trades. It trades 16 to 23 million. That's a lot of volume recently, but it doesn't really trade like that historically. But this isn't like a big name ticker. OK, but there's opportunities like this in the market all the time. If you know how to search for them and it's not that I got some type of scanner or I got a particular type of platform, I'm just reading all the time. Right. The majority of market based information is in print. 
I'm just reading all the time, even though it's online, but it's in some type of print form. So when I say print, I mean, it's written. So the majority of information about the market is actually written. Uh, it's actually on some type of documents. And so I'm just reading all the time. And that's where I'm finding a lot of my opportunities. I don't find a lot of my opportunities by watching like YouTube videos where people are fanning out over particular companies. OK, so if you're willing to do that, I can show you how to locate these kind of opportunities in the market. If you're willing to do the work, put the time in. And what I wanted to show you is that with the particular returns, the 2K a month is really not that difficult. And it'll get to a point to where you'll make the money and it'll literally be boring to you because of how easy the money came to you. And you can remember a time in which for you to make a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars, you may have had to do a lot of work. There's even business owners for them to make a grand. They got to do a lot of work to make that grand. You got to understand is that once you start to have an understanding and your understanding builds over time, you get a lot more competent and a lot more proficient. So it becomes easier to find plays in the market. It takes less time to find plays in the market over time and your returns over time start to get greater because you get a lot more conviction in what's going on and you start to understand how to enter and how to exit. Let me go over one last thing before we get out of here, because I know a lot of people question is, uh, where do I go in and out of a place? So we went on the on the 23rd. We went in at the thirty dollar mark. Right. So that was three twenty three. We went in at the thirty dollar strike. The question is, so let's go to 323. I want to show you something. 323, we're, we're right here. So it opened, it opened around, in fact, it opened red. It opened around 31, right? And started sliding down. So in 323, about the time I bought the contract, where did I buy the contract at? I pretty much bought the contract at the money. And this is what I teach people. It's easy to find your entry if you just buy at the money. It's hard to find your entry when you're buying out of the money just because you want to be in on the play. Therefore, if you just buy at the money or as close to the money as possible, it's easy to find your entry. Well, where is your exit at once you hit your profit? So once you hit whatever profit you determined you want to take or you've exceeded that, like in my situation where I have far exceeded it, where, where, where I wanted my profit to be, then it's a good time to exit. But it's easy to find your entry if you just understand, well, where is it trading at right now? It's trading at $30. Well, then that's going to be my entry. So my strike is $30. I wasn't looking for a $25 strike because now I'm $5 out of the money. So because my strike was $30, it was easy for me to understand where to go in because I look to always go in at the money or as close to at the money as possible. And if I can't afford to do that based on the expiration date I want, then maybe I don't need to be in the play. And so that's a really quick way to try to kind of determine where you enter a play, because a lot of people have an issue with that. And they're looking at break even and all this other stuff and the delta and all that. None of that stuff is really important. What's really important on the trade is IV and theta. IV, a lot of times is going to determine how much you pay for the contract It's going to determine how much you can sell the contract for. And theta is going to determine, right, uh, a lot of times whether or not the contract has any value right when you exit. Right now, strike is also important, but the two Greeks that are normally important are going to be IV and theta. So I don't worry about a lot of other stuff because once the play starts to move, those also move along with the IV. Theta never moves. Right. And what I mean, theta is that the day that expires is going to be the same when you buy it and also when you leave the play. OK, so if you ever have questions about where do I enter at, always remember, try to enter as close to the money as possible disregard everything else because that's not important because they're going to change but your strike is going to be the same when you enter and exit okay so you always want to understand that that entry point is always going to be very important but it's not something that a computer can give you some insight on where you need to enter at enter at the money as close to the money as possible and if you can't enter as close to the money as possible then maybe that's not the play for you there's going to always be another play down the road because the market provides unlimited opportunity so if you want to learn more about the highest paid part time job in the world and you want to kind of understand how to profit and how to make money out of situations like this Fubo TV Incorporated going down. Uh, I told you before, I can help you make money in the red market. I can help you make money in the green market. It really don't matter to me because it's all the same principles. It's just different sides of the ledger. Reach out to me. If you want to learn more about the IPO lockup course, reach out to me. The links are in the description. Get in with those particular courses before we continue to start pushing the price up because this return, right? Let's go into it one more time. This return right here, it pays not only for the core course, but it also pays for the IPO lockup course. 
and you still got money left over. So I want you to understand is that once you learn how to operate these kind of plays, what you're what you're being charged to get the education, the value of the education is greater than the price point. And so you want to make sure that you take advantage of this. You take advantage of this situation while I still have the time to teach you because it's a lot more strenuous to educate people than to just make the plays. Right. So I'm not going to be around forever in this particular capacity, but I want you to take advantage of that. If you know this is what you want, you want the results from this particular space or, you know, somebody in your family or maybe your friends that would be a good candidate for this course. So this is David W. Williams, also known as Diamond Dave. Hit me up in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, and I'll talk to you later.